Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 to 20. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how could it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever teaches, but whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, your word challenges us. It is a double-edged sword. Pierces to the heart. Help us to come to you in repentance and then rise from the ashes and take up this sword of the Spirit, this sword of your word and use it also to destroy the kingdom of the evil one. Help us to be light and salt as we were meant to be as your kingdom, Lord. Lead us forward, because what are we but blind without your light? Help me to proclaim your word with boldness and to be accepted by us here today. May you increase and I decrease. 
and you do abundantly beyond all that I ask or think in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So today's message might seem like a kick in the stomach while we are down. We see death in this world. Not only the people we know who have died in this past week, but we see something even worse. We see the uh, we see the, the love of death all around us. The babies being murdered. We see homosexuality being celebrated as if it was some virtue. We see the decay of this society. We see a broken nation. You might ask, where is the hope? I do not usually give titles to my sermons. Don't usually bother to do that. But if I were to give a title today for this message, I think it would be, It is Our Fault. Now, by our, I mean the church in Canada in general, as well as our share of the blame in this church too. Why do I say that? Because Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. And what is salt? Salt is a preservative. And as believers, who was Jesus talking to? First of all, he was talking there. We see right at the beginning to his disciples. His disciples came to, be, to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them. And we are his disciples too. And Jesus said to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And so, if we are the salt, we are what preserves our society from corruption. You are the light of the world, and if we are the light, then we are what dispels the darkness. But oh, how that darkness is coming even darker these days. It's not an easy f truth to accept. But this means that we have failed to shine the light. You see, this is why church is essential. And you see, many people have misunderstood the whole concept of church. They think it's just, oh, you come in, you listen to somebody preach for a few minutes, and then um, that's it. You go home and you enjoy the rest of your week. Well, if anybody understood even what preaching was, it is to train the people of God to join in the fight against the kingdom of the evil one. And these should be our training grounds, brothers and sisters, to train our people, to train believers, so that in the rest of the week they can fight. They can tell their friends about the gospel. They can evangelize. They can go out to the places of death and preach to them. This is what the church is supposed to be doing. And so when the government tells us, okay, time to shut down because there's this spooky virus, we should be saying, no! We will not shut down! Your decrees are unrighteous! We will not bow to you!
and how it is so many of churches across this land have done the opposite of what Jesus commands, the opposite of what Scripture commands, saying do not neglect, do not neglect the assembling of ourselves. And these commands which are in Scripture, how, how does it not fall under the same condemnation where Jesus says, Truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter of stroke shall pass away from the law. Now, of course, Jesus had in mind the law of Moses, the Old Testament, but we have to recognize the New Testament is Scripture too. It's the law of God just as much as the Old Testament. And Jesus says, whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. And all these years, all these years, we knew, we knew that babies were being murdered every day in our country. How long has this church been around? We knew it. And we haven't said anything publicly until last year. One event. Now, we have resolved to at least try to do something about Myanmar at least once a month. And we should. At least it's a starting point. We should. But how were we silent all these years about the very injustice in our own backyard, in our very own city? How, if all the four million babies that were murdered in Canada, the more than four million were piled up before us, and the question would be, why were you silent? Why? Did you not say a thing, O oh church? And then now, all of a sudden, we see the government coming down upon the church and we wonder why. Where have we been? What have we done? I think perhaps a great deal of this is because we have a very false eschatology as well, where we just think, well, the church is just supposed to be diminishing, diminishing, and the evil is just supposed to grow and grow until the day that Jesus returns, and well, or, or until the day that he just takes us away, and, and that will be it. But that is not what Jesus commanded us. You are the light of the world. And if we look at what Scripture prophesies, if we look at Daniel chapter 2, if you remember, Daniel had a dream of this great statue. It actually was the king's dream, and God revealed it to Daniel. And he foretold of the kingdom of the Romans, of the Greeks, and of the Persians, and the fall of the Babylonian Empire. All of it was foretold. And if you remember, if you remember that at the end, at the end of this, there is, as it says in the scripture, then the iron, the clay, the bronze, that's what the statue was made of, if you remember. The iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. 
and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. It filled the whole earth. Now, if you do not remember what this kingdom is, read the interpretation at the end, which says, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will, it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future so the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. Now this kingdom, what is this kingdom? I think it's plain this is the kingdom of God. And when Jesus came, he said... Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. That kingdom has already been introduced. Made without hands. Advanced by the proclamation of his gospel. And it grows and fills the whole earth. You know, the band name Skillet has a song called The Resistance. And in it, it says, This is how we rise up, heavy as a hurricane, louder than a freight train. This is our world. They can never have it. This is our world because Jesus is our king. This is our world because Jesus has conquered victory. If you remember, in Romans chapter 8, he says that we are more than conquerors because of him who loved us. And it's about time that us Christians start to act like it. Start to act like everything that we see belongs to Jesus Christ. Now, this we may seem to be in the ashes right now. And everything I've said so far may seem like a rather strong rebuke. I believe we need to hear it, but that's not where it ends. Where do we rise up from here? How do we rise up? Well, actually, the way up is down. We must get on our knees in repentance. It's hard to say, to speak of this, when I myself do not see the way forward very clearly, yet I know that the starting point is repentance. That is the starting point, just as it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 2. Sorry, 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Where it says... If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. And so it is 
time for us to recognize too. This is why church is so essential, so that we can come together in repentance before our God, so that our land could be healed. And yet something that troubles me so much is that we think that we're there's so many people, they think, well, we, we just need to pray about it, but they are not willing to repent of their wicked ways. What kind of prayer is that? And for us here in this country, our wicked ways is that we have... We have just been doing church without doing the hard work of seeking justice in the land, rebuking the evildoers, and bringing the gospel into conflict with that godless society. Now even in Karen State, one of the things that truly troubles me, yes, I have seen that many people are praying, and that is encouraging, but one of the things that troubles me is that the very same people who are now praying, a very great deal of them are not even reading the Word of God. How can we expect God to heal the land when we turn a deaf ear to His Word? So my call here is for obedience to the Word of God, to hear it and not stop there, but obey it.